All right. Welcome back to Extra AI, your go-to podcast for all things AI and machine learning. In each episode, we dive into the exciting developments, insights from top experts, and the ethical implications of these different transformative technologies. So whether you're a gig name looking to understand AI, a seasoned professional keeping up with the trends, or simply curious about the tech shaping our world, Extra AI has something for you. We break down complex topics, making them accessible for all. Don't miss out on navigating the AI landscape with us. And subscribe to Extra AI today on your favorite podcast platform. Join the conversation. Be part of the AI revolution with Extra AI. X-T-R-A-W-K-I. All right, uh, welcome back to our series, Extra AI, the podcast series on machine learning and AI applications. And today we are starting the season six and we have an interesting guest. We are welcoming back Lucas N.P. Eger. He's no stranger to our podcast. We had a very interesting conversation with him at the end of season three. And today, season six, I've invited him back. And just a quick background about Lucas. He's the He's leading the innovation office and strategic projects at SAP Signavio. He's basically the IOSP organization is tasked to de-risk new product ideas and establish the best in class product discovery practices. But today we wanted to, and, and last time I think when we discussed, we also, I also told that Lucas has some additional things that he has done in the past, like he has started founded multiple companies in Berlin, helped scale data science and machine learning teams. He also has some movie credits for his computer graphics research and also published a book on philosophy. So today I wanted to kind of, in this world of, I think in the last six months, a lot has changed in the world. We also have now a lot of things going on around chat GPT and other things. So I also want to get his aspects or uh, perspectives on chat GPT, the language models, and also maybe a bit of the philosophy side of the things. Over to you, Lucas. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to come back. Uh, it's always great to have this erudite and informed conversations. And um, look, last time we talked about the risking uh, ideas, innovative ideas. In the meantime, large language models really had their, what people call the iPhone moment. And it looks like half of the world is now trying to de-risk exactly this AI technology. So we're applying in a, in a sense, um, all of the lessons we talked about in your last podcast that I appeared in about desirability, feasibility, viability, how to manage risky projects and today we're doing it at a scale that is unprecedented not just us but pretty much every company i read that um 80 percent of ceos think mm -hmm. that it is crucial to be part of the ai game um i i cannot pinpoint exactly when the study came out but I'm 100% certain that this number has only gone up since the release of GPT-4. And for our listeners, we're recording this um, in the second quarter of 2023. Thank you, Lucas. Amazing uh, introduction as always from you. So without any further ado, let's get into maybe the world of uh, the chat GPT, right? The large language models. Uh, mm -hmm. So as the quote goes, there are decades where nothing happens, and then there is a week when decades happen. But if you also yes. see the market in total, I think a lot of things have happened. So do you want to give your perspective on what is happening in the last maybe these two quarters before we met? Sure. And your take on it. Yes, absolutely. Let me quickly go back um, just for the context. So we we have known that AI, for better or worse, will be a very important factor for the world and for industries and big corporations. Why? Because we had a, a 
factor, multitude of factors coming together that previously weren't available. This is on the one hand side, the availability of data. So Mm -hmm. our ability to have massive amounts of data and use them to create predictive algorithms. Second, the compute was scaling exponentially and came to a point where it was really feasible to create deep and big models. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, our understanding of data and, and algorithms Um, pushed a couple of innovations. So we already knew for, let's say, the last at least, at least 10, probably almost 15 years that AI was very important. Now, in the the beginning of, let's say, this new AI era, Mm -hmm. um, cloud native big companies were leading the charge. They set up their organizations in a way where they could really take advantage of data and use predictive algorithms to improve their business operations in any way or form, right? You can think from Spotify and music recommendations all the way to um, like predicting prices for advert um, auctions at at Facebook or or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, really like only in the last four or five years, something really interesting happened. Namely, around 2017, a very important paper came out, uh, which was called, is called, Attention is All You Need. And they essentially talked about a new um, algorithm class, Mm -hmm. which uses attention, which is a generative model that takes language and essentially predicts the next like token, the next right. word in the sentence, let's say, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, you could think of it as, you know, this is just a predictive engine, just like so many others. It works on language and um, it feeds back its results. And, you know, it's it's interesting. It, um, okay, what, what gives? Previously, we had all these different domains, vision, like text, voice, and they all like were their own little domains where everybody worked in their own field. Now, what now has come to pass in the last year is that we see that as language models got really good, Mm -hmm. they kind of traverse and bridge the gaps between domains. And now everything has fallen into this one world of language models. And language models are the lingua franca, so the one translational center point between different domains. To give you an example, Mm -hmm. like if you have a picture and you look at the pixel and you predict the next pixel, they were able or they are able to frame the problem of predicting the next pixel uh, provided, you know, the the surrounding of a pixel, just as you can predict the next word in a sentence. So in a way, this transformer networks, right? These neural networks Mm -hmm. were being applied to different domains and they were extremely successful. Now everything comes into this one domain. Um, We had like a big step change because the models got so big. And now we see that this one approach can reign supreme or is like extremely competent in solving a vast array of very interesting problems. Now that happened and that happened with ChatGPT, which essentially wasn't really planned as a release. Mm -hmm. They had GPT-3 and they were training for GPT-4, but because they thought somebody else could steal their funder, and I'm talking about OpenAI, they Mm -hmm. decided to quickly make a demo and show the results of GPT 3.5, and which they call chat GPT. Mm-hmm. And then the rest, in a sense, is history because it was the pr- product that uh, onboarded the first million users, the fastest of all products uh, as of today. So in less than a week, they onboarded the first million users. And um, it created a, a different world in a way because now everybody knows what chat GPT stands for, not necessarily what it really is, And it has created like this flywheel of attention and also like not only attention, but money, people, everything funneling into this. Okay, something has changed and it's big now. And that's, I guess, why uh, people call it the 
iPhone moment for AI. So just to recap, AI was always there. Previously, it was very dispersed in different fields that didn't talk much. Only the biggest companies were capable of executing. They were already doing a good job. Then right. 2017, a new architecture came out that proved to be very successful in translating between domains, uh, very, very applicable. And based on this type of breakthrough, the newest instantiations of this technology called cheap, well, GPT is actually a product name, just like Xerox, right? But, right. you know, like this type of technology now has really come into full fruition um, because the size and the magnitude of the models have synergetic effects and have, you know, qualities that we didn't expect. And now everybody sees that this is a big thing and everybody is in for the ride. Right. So you've uh, greatly explained that. I think this reminds me when we go back, I think, like you right, rightfully mentioned, the iPhone moment, or if I can even go a little bit more into the past, it is also in a way you could also kind of relate it with this internet browser war moment, where now the next step, what is happening here is that Yes, OpenAI came up with ChatGPT and then Microsoft kind of invested in that and then they've kind of uh, enhancing their search with this. And now Google has already been working on this and then you have Baidu and you have... So do you do you also foresee a similar kind of a pattern where in late 90s we have seen these browser war all around? Uh, so do you... And they, do you see any resemblances to that and do you yeah. think that some kind of a consolidation is going to happen at some point of time that's a great question um so first of all this entire like new cycle started well, well it's not true but one of the big things for us um in the it industry was when we heard that um, microsoft would invest 10 billion into open ai and subsequently the release of of ai features um which was very bullish you know and right. people were were asking why this is happening and and what is the motivation i think the motivation um was clear um there is a 450 ish um, billion dollar market for um search on the internet mm -hmm. right and currently the microsoft search is please don't quote me on the exact numbers but you know like ballpark right. figure is it's like five percent right right so um or around that size it's definitely dominated by over 80 percent google okay and this large language models were first seen as a new way of search right mm -hmm. so to have a better way of like sorting and and getting through the, the world's data so it was seen as okay we're starting a new browser wars and it looked like the dust had already settled we have a cemented ways of things google is the 800 pound gorilla and then mm -hmm. like the ceo of, of microsoft um actually said well we kind of want to invite Google for a dance, right? It was very <laughs> facetious. He said, like, we want to make them dance. And surely the 800 pound gorilla started dancing because they said, well, this is code red. Essentially, the future of this company depends on our ability to execute on this next transformational change in IT. So let's get into it. So there is a good reason to to talk about this in and frame it as, you know, the next big, whatever, browser wars, phone wars or whatever, uh, because it has on the outside, it has all of the makings of one of those things, right? It costs tremendous amounts of money to create a large language model, like the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman said, I wateringly high costs to train those models. We know from research that they are in the millions, so you can spend anything from one to 10 million for such a big foundational model. Foundational model means like it's really the biggest where you start training from zero. Um, and there is clear modes, like distinct 
advantages for your business that are defensible if you have those capabilities, if you can train those models and so forth. Additionally, you only need like one really, really good model. You don't need mm -hmm. 20, right? Like in a sense, it, it, it feels like a winner takes all market. However, recently, let's say after GPT-4 came out, there were a couple of things that happened in the world that I personally did not really anticipate that mm -hmm. could shift this balance. And there is at least two things that I want to mention. First of all is that um, a group, a research group out of Stanford was able to show that you don't need to invest that much money to get almost the same results. Mm -hmm. How did they do it? Now, it's actually, it's it's really simple to understand and ingenious, but at the same time, it, it's kind of like very surprising. Uh, instead of taking the best model and trying to recreate it from scratch, scratch they took an inferior model, mm -hmm. which has the same type of architecture. So in principle, it's also capable of doing great things and hooked it up with a much better model. So think of it as a master and or a mentor and a learner or an apprentice. Mm -hmm. And they told the smaller model, ask your mentor, ask yourself, compare the differences in answers. And when in doubt, always go with your mentor. And so by creating like automated feedback loops between two models where one is less, uh, less well-trained, they were showing that it's, it's, it's possible to train up like an inferior model to almost the performance of a better model with completely like orders of magnitude cheaper economics, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, that was one of the things that were really surprising. Uh, I should say as a caveat, it's really, really hard if you have, let's say, a large language model and you sell it to bigger organizations or the internet at large, it's really, really hard to decide whether a query is a genuine query or mm -hmm. something that will be used to train up another model. I I would say if you wanted to, you could always camouflage your request. So in a way, it's it's not something you can guard against. You cannot say, okay, I don't want this to happen. Obviously you can put it in your terms and services. You can say like, as soon as you do that, you're in violation of the terms and services and we can cancel our relationship, the business relationship. But from a technical perspective, it's, it's, it's not trivial to understand whether this is going on. Now, this is one thing. Mm -hmm. So the economics got upended. Now, the mm -hmm. second thing is that, um, there was some sort of a call to arms right. because people and researchers said, we don't want this type of technology to be dominated and owned by very few companies and research should be open. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand that the last 10 years, there was no clear economic incentives to keep research guarded. So the entire field of AI has been socialized for a generation to be open, to share, to publish papers. Now the incentives have changed, but the people don't change in a night. So right. within the field of AI, there's tons of people who feel that it is not aligned with their values and what the field stands for, to now close down research and not share insights for whatever you know research. So there's a big momentum of people pushing an open source angle. Mm -hmm. And this, interesting enough, you not only, you could say like, okay, but if everybody works in the industry, then the industry can clamp down on this open efforts. But then, one of the key factors of having a good model is having good data. And mm -hmm. good data is produced by people asking interesting questions and then evaluating whether the answer was good or not. And that everyone can do. So they were capable of finding 10,000s of people who would contribute and help. Um, so you asked, are we in the midst of a new browser wars? In the beginning, it looked totally like it because of the economics, because of the winner take all markets, because of the dynamics of the market recently because of research and what has happened and you know as a grassroots movement 
I'm not so sure any longer. I do believe that we will have a consolidation of the biggest players, Mm -hmm. but I also think that we are not yet certain how it will look like. I can, I can think of a world that's very pluralistic Mm -hmm. and I can also see a world where we get in a very centralized um, fashion of using this technology. It also depends a little bit ultimately whether this technology needs anti-proliferation you know laws for instance i know this now comes out of left field but yeah. um you, you know we there is certain technologies in the world where we decide that not everyone should have access to it and um, also the jury is out on that as well right so you brought up some very good points i think starting with identifying and picking up which particular model that I have to choose, whether where these models, they can self-learn and identify, hey, I take it from this mentor model or maybe I take it from this learner model. So there is a concept that is evolving over there. I think maybe we'll unpack or go into that a bit more, which is where it is kind of going through the auto GPT kind of a approach uh, where recently I also uh, heard into a like listen to a uh, a big podcast around uh, the All In podcast where they were talking about this Auto GPT, and also you interestingly touched another aspect about Open AI, uh, Open versus Closed AI, because this is where talking about how we are, uh, what kinds of these things that we are doing here can be available to the complete general public. And because there are also now thoughts about like the big leaders like Elon Musk and maybe a few others who came out and said that, hey, maybe we need to take a pause because we need to think about what kind of ethical implications are getting there. And even uh, Google's um, Sundar Pichai came out and said that, hey, uh, I also made a note about that. He was talking about ethics and philosophy when talking about uh, AI and how we are building. And this is where I want yeah. to touch back or connect back to your thoughts about uh, the philosophy of mind and what these leads into. Okay, sure. Let's start with your first question. And then, because mm-hmm. probably we'll take like a, a couple of sentences to explain what's happening there. And then let's revise the second part and let's see where we want to go. But for the listeners, Auto GPT is has nothing to do with Chat GPT, OpenAI, or the big companies. Essentially, what it is is um, a private, like repository. Well, it's not private; it was open source. But you know, like a private effort to use um, GPT four or the technology in a novel way, namely. Right now, if you prompt GPT, GPT-4, for instance, and you say like, hey, write me a text, it's it's almost like um, a ping pong, right? I say, please do this, and I get one output. And I say like, oh, that's interesting. I can reference my output because like, hey, it's nice what you wrote, but please change the last paragraph or whatever. And these kind of things work. Now, what the people behind auto GPT figured out is that you could do a hierarchy of those interactions and let them perform like the sequence of steps by the language model itself. Like a specific use case would be to do a multi-step like task. So instead of saying, hey, write an article, AutoGPT's use case is of defining a task and then letting GPT or any API understand how to break it down or try to break it down, see how it's performing, reviewing its own success, and then pushing through almost like a project list. So in Mm -hmm. essence, what you're doing with auto GPT is you're saying like, I want to, let's, um, let's give a very simple example. I want to buy, um, I don't know, like a cup that looks like the 
uh, that you know is styled in the fashion of my favorite music bands right so then gpt would break it down would say like okay we need to figure out what's your like your favorite music right what are the associative colors then let's source like who is selling cups who has merchandise of that relates to it or can we print it so it would come up with a strategic plan of following through multiple steps all the way to figuring out payment and shipping and, and whatnot right and the important part is it creates the plan it then goes through the plan it is connected to the internet which is a big difference by the way to gpt4 we mm -hmm. haven't mentioned that but gpt4 now was trained in uh, 2022 um, it stopped training mid-year 2022. It was then quality controlled and refined. But essentially, it is like in a box. So it doesn't know what has happened in the last couple of months. It doesn't know like about sports or news events. It's 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 in a way it's cut off. It's quarantined. Now AutoGPT uses the technology, but is connected to the internet to create agents can follow up plans. And so they have a couple of features like being aware of the state they, and like knowing what has already been done. And then also super interesting and that's really, really uh, fascinating to ask GPT itself, do you think you did well on the last task, right? And so it's taking this idea of having something very powerful that can do ambiguous one-shot tasks and making it useful in a much bigger orchestration of tasks where you have more abstract or harder to pull off tasks, so to speak. Um, that is something that they're working on, like AutoGPT, which is open source. But um, coming back to OpenAI or any other company that works on foundational models, everybody now is racing towards parts that need to be embedded in their models that will extend their capabilities. And it's not yet clear what are the most lucrative or the most important parts. So there's an obvious extension, which is plugins, right? You want to mm -hmm. be able to let other people give capabilities to your language model. So it extends the range of capabilities. Um, but you know, you could go into auto GPT, you could go into plugins, you could go into various different things. And right now there is uh we don't know yet where it will go. So it's, 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 it's very interesting times. And we see every day something is changing. Like the pace of change is, is just insane. It's even for people who are like in the field, mm -hmm. um, for them, it's really challenging. I recently watched a talk about alignment problems and like uh, dangers of AI. Um, and they said they had to update their slides every day because every day when they checked uh, their Twitter feed, something new would come up that was highly relevant to, to the conversation. Um, so yeah, that's where I see like where auto GPT is right now. The important part is we already know like everybody's searching for how to make best use of it. And it's, it's um, yeah, the, the, the jury is still out on where all of this is going. Right, right. So yeah, coming back to that uh, question, I think uh, let me, I want to go uh, one step back and then um, talk about the value add, right? Like. Uh, into this, mm. where's the value add? So now we are creating the cost of creating all this digital content across all these different domains using these large language models. Definitely, it is going towards the energy costs and the electricity costs. Yeah. So, what are, what are your thoughts around that? I know we are now that there are a lot of thoughts around that, like we are moving towards like. Uh, investing in all kinds of energy and then kind of producing it at a faster pace. Uh, so where, where where is the value add and where are we going there? Yeah, so we kind of, we skipped one of your questions, but I can passingly mention one of the parts here um, in terms of like the answer to the question you asked about the openness or the closeness yes. of this industry. Some of the players have decided to, players, I mean, like corporate entities, 
to not further open up the research. Mm -hmm. And let's say a couple of years ago, every new paper, scientific paper in the field of AI would meticulously line out the, the hardware, the network architecture, the data, like every part, the regimen, like the read, like that was needed to create the outcome. Um, open AI in its name, like always had like this aspiration to be as open as possible. However, for multiple reasons, um, they now in their last iteration with GPT-4, essentially it's that at the beginning of their paper, and they didn't call it research paper, but like a technical report, they said they will give no detail about architecture data, the regimen of training and, and so forth. Right. So there's a, there's a very clear like shift in the zeitgeist because everybody understands like this is a very substantial step change and in innovation. We haven't figured out how to monetize. We don't know yet what are the strategic long-term modes are for this technology. So where can I exploit a market? Who will pay what and, and how to defend that? Um, so um, people are guarded about that. Also for security issues. But I would, I'm not trying to be cynical, but I would say mm -hmm. the business side currently motivates more than, than the safety side of things. Um, now in terms of like, where is money to be made? We don't know yet. What we know and what is very important, like from a very principled high level perspective is, this technology has an onboarding ramp in terms of value. What do I mean by that? Imagine a Tesla, a self-driving car. A self-driving car, if you click the autopilot, you only will use it like not as a gimmick or okay, let's see what can it do, but actually use it, be willing to pay for it and, and be excited about the feature if this autopilot is better than 99.999, at least 99% of drivers, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, for you, the relative value of this, let's say, autopilot button is minute, right? It's right. very, very little. However, already with the LLM technology that we have today, you can find clear use cases that people would be willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. So let's say, I put in like all my emails and I want to know which one are the most important. Mm -hmm. um, I want the algorithm to rank them and I want for the top three to already based on my inbox craft the reply that is most plausible. Right. And then I can start with a draft like that already, like people would pay a subscription to do that. Okay. So the economics are different because you don't have like this one binary one O and then it's worth like, immense amounts of, of, of money, but rather you have a soft slope where you can go up. So this is in terms of economics, that's better. Right. Um, now, the other thing is because it's language, not everyone is a driver. Right. Every person on earth uses language. That's another thing that is an indication of why this technology is so interesting and why we believe so much money or so much capital will be or is allocated and there will be so many returns to the details of what is happening i have tried to read pretty much all of the the corporate strategy stuff that's out there people have a lot of estimated guests nobody knows right it's still guessing what we know of today is we typically have certain what what is called moats, right? So mm -hmm. defensible like areas that are hard to bridge. And we have stuff like scale moats, right? It's it's like really like I'm bigger. Because of it, I have like economies of scale or I have supply modes. I can do stuff because I have the compute hardware that you don't have, which for instance, for China is true because they're now sanctioned in terms of like the newest AI chips or ecosystem modes or whatever, like ecosystem meaning like I already have an app store or whatever, you don't have that. And we don't know exactly how that will play out. And it doesn't seem like they're very defensible. 
around AI, right? Because the only thing that currently is very defensible is the base layer. Everyone who wants to use AI needs really fast and good uh, and great compute and a network that is really, really uh, like highly modern and, and, and capable. So NVIDIA's, Intel, and all of the, the companies that s- supply like the base layer, they're currently like I would say making outsized or over-indexing on, on this, um, where ultimately you can capture your market we still don't know yet. Right, right. No, there is, uh, I completely agree with what you're saying. I think there is a lot of unknowns out there. And like like we know, we've been uh, hearing on both sides of the coin, right? Like there are there are companies and there are firms and there are, individuals who are supporting the more openness and there are individuals and companies and corporations maybe focusing and saying that okay ai has to be now governed ai has to be regulated there was this recent conversation i was listening in where chamath was talking about saying that hey he he sent a tweet a, a tweet out there on twitter and there were like 1.2 million views he was talking about uh, Maybe uh, AI should be more regulated or more governed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was talking about how these different, before something comes out, maybe the governments have to come out and uh, maybe lay out some regulations. Do you think that is going to, I know we are all again discussing about this. Any thoughts around that? Because again, we are talking about the ethical values and then we are getting into the philosophy of it, right? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Um, there's a big debate right now whether what is the right way of handling this technology. And there's a couple of cohorts of people. There's people um, that believe that if we push this technology, there's some sort of a phase change or runaway point Point, whether they call it singularity or AGI or super intelligence, there's multiple words. But essentially, their idea is that, and this is like one that got very prominent, let's say, in the last couple of weeks now, that right. if we create an intelligence that outstrips our capacity to herd it or keep it under control, it will have a runaway effect. It will get much smarter because it can you know, get smarter by itself. And it will get so smart that it will have no interest in either accepting or even tolerating humanity. Um, it, we would be at best a nuisance to it. And the <laughs> consequential step would be the annihilation or let's say the end of humanity. Um, this is this is one part, right? Then there is, on the other side, there is, and this is, I would say, a more extreme kind of, of perspective, right? If we create AI and we don't know when exactly this happens, but we're pushing in this direction, there will be like a runoff point where there's no return and just like a boulder rolling downhill. From there on, it's over. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side, there is versions of transhumanism where they say like oh this is the best thing ever and if we have intelligence we will raise to the level of gods and we might be even able to merge with the technology and be super enabled human machine hybrids or whatever um and we have both although right now like more more of the attention is with people who believe that or who talk about the dangers of AI. All right, so those are two things. Now in the right. middle is the question is, if it is a tool, if it's not like its own agent, and if it's not just like a, like an addition to, to us, um, like if it's a tool, in what way should we work with it and how should it be regulated? Um, and depending on, on, on the application, it can be perceived as a weapon or a tool. Um, 
in general, legislature is is a very laggard kind of affair. And that's a okay. good thing. You don't want laws to change every day. You want to be sure that once you regulate or change the way we govern our world, that this is based on not only intuition, but on, on some some remnants of rational, like this is how it should be done and, and it's effective and efficient, or at least effective. Mm -hmm. um, so very often, not only is it a lagging kind of effect, but also it tries to conserve old laws and make them applicable to the to the next thing so what do i mean by that Let, let's give a concrete example when aviation took off quite literally and there were the first commercial planes people sued because they said like well i own a plot of land and mm -hmm. at least here in the us if you own a plot of land you own everything with which is below and above right, right. it's your land and all the way up so essentially, some people said planes are trespassing and I want royalties. And then the law got changed because they like people decided that despite best practices and how law was previously interpreted, it wouldn't be feasible for the future. Okay. So they mm -hmm. said, like, okay, no, we're we're not giving a couple of cents to everyone just because a plane flies over. That just doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. So they changed the law. Right now, the law is still in a world where scarcity was prevalent. Mm -hmm. So the law isn't wasn't or most of the IP laws and most of the things that govern our world are from a time where, let's say, AI wasn't a thing and digitalization itself was only just beginning. Um, and we need to update our laws and that cannot happen overnight. And so the question of how we should govern it is is a tricky one because the system we're currently using is outdated and while we're right. talking about it everything is changing at a insane pace now how should we govern it there's multiple ways right you could mandate that the industry says or ensures that nothing bad is happening right so they they self-impose certain limits. So for instance, in Central Europe, um, German automakers have self-imposed speed limits on their cars. So most cars will not drive faster than, I'm not sure, like 220, 250. Right. There are supercars and you obviously can pay for a car that goes faster, but essentially the car manufacturers decided, okay, here's like, some sort of like we don't go above that right because then it just gets too dangerous um other things are clear regulations like with drug discovery you cannot bring a drug to market before you have done a battery of tests and you have jumped through multiple increasingly more costly and 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 hard to pull off hoops in terms of like clinical trials um, we then have heavily regulated industries that work in in the middle or, right. you know, all different kinds of things. We don't know yet um, how a, the AI world will shake out because, well, <laughs> it's, it's just this trillion dollar market is popping up in the backyards of our like economic world. And we don't know really how to apply it because... As I said, it's not one singular use case. Language is very pervasive. I think what's very interesting is um, Yul Harari, like the author of Sapiens and, mm -hmm. and, and Deus Ex, said that for him, and, and I'm paraphrasing because I, I don't know the quote by heart, but mm -hmm. he said what the atom bomb was to the physical world or, or large language models or AI to like society and our thinking. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there is a correlation between danger and potency. Mm -hmm. So as models get more potent in solving problems and are more helpful, they will also be more dangerous if they are not used in a, you know, in a way uh, that is is not devious, malicious, or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, 
And I can give a lot of examples, but uh, what we see is that there is new forms of attacks where we don't have any intuition mm -hmm. and we don't have like the guardrails or the the safety intuition or, or responses that we otherwise would have. Um, so um, coming back to the original question, do I believe, I mean, that was not exactly a question, do I believe that we should have a moratorium or should stop research? I don't think this is practical or will work. Right. Do I think that we need to be cautious in how we apply the technology? Yes, because it's insanely powerful and um, we haven't figured out what it can do. Like nobody, just to give one more example, nobody thought that social networks would be corrosive to politics or would have detrimental health effects to young girls. Because mm -hmm. we thought social media connects people, it empowers people, it gives everybody a voice, and it bridges between people that otherwise could not connect. What happened is that, I'm not saying all of it, but what happened was that we showed, we proved that it can be used mm -hmm. to create further divide and to increase social pressure on young and impressionable minds. And if, you know, if that can happen with, let's say, a com comparatively boring technology like social media, which is, I mean, the scale is, is, is enormous and it's hard to pull it off, but the technology itself is, is not that insanely complicated. If you compare that to large language models and AI, I think it will give you maybe a first order intuition that the un expected or not yet foreseen consequences are most likely much bigger than in the case of let's say for for example um social media so yeah we have to tread carefully beautiful no i completely agree with uh, what you're saying um, i know we did not even realize that this is a very interesting conversation that we are having Before I close this by asking some uh, the near term future about how enterprises are going to work or evolve using the uh, these different large language models, for example, like SAP, Oracle, and all these enterprise firms, maybe do you want to take a quick um, pause or a quick uh, uh, diversion or a tangential question about the area of philosophy of mind and what Chalmers meant oh, yeah. when he talks about the hard problem, because we are talking now about a lot of this AI and the brain and all these things coming in, right? Do you want to, I know you come from the philosophy background, so I thought like maybe a, a, a one minute or a two minute yeah. thoughts around that. Yeah, so there is like a long history in trying to explain how the mind works. And I think in philosophy, everybody knows about Descartes, right? Mm -hmm. I think, therefore, I am. Um, but even before then, people were questioning, like, how our, like, how consciousness works. What does it mean to have an impression of the world? Um, and there's a lot of fancy words like qualia, meaning like like the impression that I have of an experience and what its constitutional like qualities in the brain. But uh, very often when we talk about uh, like philosophy and, 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 and the topics are, can we say how our brain works and can we understand how consciousness works? Mm -hmm. And one of the currently very like, well-known philosophers, contemporary philosophers, is David Chalmers. And he is um, he is known for dividing the problem of consciousness and saying, hey, there is an easy and the hard problem. Um, and he says, essentially, the easy problem, and it's a misnomer because the easy problem yeah. is much harder than anything we already understand. <laughs> right. but essentially, he says, the easy problem is being able to explain how the cognitive functions work. 
right? Mm -hmm. How does the brain work? So to give you an analogy, the easy problem in terms of flight would be to understand aerodynamics, to see a bird and say like, hey, what the bird is doing with its wings, mm -hmm. this is one way of solving drag and lift and turbulences and airflow, right? Mm -hmm. I should be very clear. We have in no way or form figured out the easy problem. <laughs> right. So like, this is not something that um that 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 we know exactly what, what's happening, right? Um now, but then he went on and said, like, okay, this this is the hard problem. Oh, sorry, this is the easy problem. Now, what is the hard problem? Um, the hard problem is what it really means to have a consciousness. Right. to be conscious um, and that extends further than just being able to to come up with an explanation why a neuron fires um, not every philosopher agrees that there is this distinction mm -hmm. or whether they're important i think it's um people tend to want to walk into that dichotomy or or, or like this distinction because it elevates consciousness. It says that consciousness is something of an emergent behavior that is more than just the sum of its parts. And it has um, a specific set of qualities that make it unique. So we're not just you like biological automatas. We're not just like biological machines. Um, and there is like for each one of those ideas, right? That everything is, can be explained by physics. You know, there's a word which is mm -hmm. called physicalism, right? And so no matter what on this entire spectrum of ideas um, from A to Z, there is like a couple of hundred years of, of philosophers thinking about it. What's interesting now with, with large language models is that so far, all of those investigations and ideas have been solipsistic, meaning they always revolved around themselves, namely us humans. And for mm -hmm. the first time, we're now really going into what is consciousness if it's not based on a biological machine. Now, you could say, hey, there has been tons of studies with animals and they have some sort of consciousness and, and babies and and you know there, there's multiple ways of, of talking about it but i think it's qualitatively different if we create science, like uh, artificial instances mm -hmm. and now we have to solve for what is consciousness um why this is such an interesting quality because a most people believe or have an intuition that this is what makes us uniquely human right. and then b I think because of that, we also tether or connected with not only, oh, this is an interesting phenomenon. It also comes with il um, inalienable rights or respect or, you know, like if you see that something is conscious, I think we're deeply programmed to try to have some empathy or respect or you know, as soon as we know that an entity, whether it's an animal or something else, can experience pain, we would automatically feel a moral dilemma, right? Mm -hmm. You could you could say, for instance, like, let's make like on the fly, let's make a thought experiment, mm -hmm. right? Like if I told you that there is a computer that can actually experience pain, it's a it's an AI <laughs> and it can feel pain, but right. I can push a button and erase all of its memory. And then I would say, like, feel free to inflict pain. Right? How would you feel about it? Like, I've never tested that with a representative, <laughs> like, you know, group of people. But I guess, please, how, how would you feel about, like, now, like, inflicting pain on, on, on an AI that can feel pain? Right. No, that's a very interesting question that you raised. I think... On the same topic, I think over the weekend, I was listening into one of these podcast conversation or YouTube video wherein uh, 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 I think uh, the founder of Cypher and Signal, I think Mr. Ian Beecroft, yeah. he was talking about how humans are becoming like machines and machines are becoming like humans. I think yeah. this is where it is going, but 
yeah, I, I know it's very tough to answer that question. Um, but uh, I know um, before so, we can, yeah. No, but, you know, as you, you know, everybody is struggling. It's not just you. Yeah. Everybody yeah. would be like, oh, this is like what an, do I do? <laughs> a conundrum. What, what, what do I do? Yeah. And because of that, for us, it's interesting or important to figure out what consciousness means. Because intuitively, it's not just an abstract, like mathematical or moral question where we say like, ah, oh, it's kind of neat to know whether a prime number is like this or that, or, you know, like, or whether black holes have a temperature, or, you know, whatever. It is very deeply connected to our experience of the world and what to us it means to be human. And so we're, we're struggling with that question. And um yeah that's no i know that's going to be a very crucial question going forward i know didn't even realize we said close to an hour or an hour uh, i would definitely want to continue this conversation maybe some other time and dig deeper into some of the blogs i know you have been very active on linkedin you're putting a lot of different blogs about uh, how the evolution of chat GPT and a lot of other things like uh, some of these blogs I follow. I also uh, urge my audience and listeners to go over the blogs uh, that you have put together. Any closing remarks, anything, Lucas, that you would want to provide to the audience in the context of all this is happening and how enterprises can benefit? Because that's where mm. I want to tie. Sure. If you want to tie it up with enterprises, I would say right now we are what I personally called the peacock face you know when a peacock shows all its feathers mm -hmm. because we haven't really fully figured out where to best apply this technology and in what form it right now just mimics the first approximation namely a chat interface so people just try to implement this chat interface wherever they see it fit and they want to show that their let's say corporate fitness uh, mm -hmm. to you know borrow like a, a metaphor from darwin they want to show that they're good in executing and that they're able to implement an api and, and put this to use and this peacocking phase will last for a little while longer so now companies are just racing to show that they can do it and they want to be part of it the really interesting part will start when we're taking the technology and we're not just imitating what has come before Mm -hmm. You know, movies weren't interesting in the first year where movies were created because essentially they were like an imitation of photography, right? They right. didn't right. move. There was no cin cinematography, no narrative arts. It was just like, look at this train arriving. It's like a painting, but it moves. And it took like the better part of a century to come up with unique language, unique styles of conveying information. I think we're in a very accelerated version of that. We are now trying to figure out this capability is like an overhang in the world. We have more capability than we have product management or user experience understanding of what to do with this capability. Mm -hmm. So even if it looks like everybody's off to the races and if you start now, you're late, I mm -hmm. would say that's not true because right now, it's all about the peacock game, and which is also good, right? I mean, it's right. not easy to implement like a, a new technology into a bigger like corporate structure. But the really big and interesting wins for companies will happen mm -hmm. once we evolve what is currently just an not abstract, but you know, like a, a barely defined like capability and mold it into real value for the customers, okay? And we don't know how that will look like, but I would, I for one would be shocked if it looks like a chat interface. So that's the mm -hmm. first thing. Um, now, the second question, how would I tie it up and, and, and for your audience? I think that um, trying to engage, like, compared to other technologies, it's so much easier to get your, you know, like quote unquote, roll your sleeves up and get your hands dirty. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's it doesn't cost anything to interact with large language models and to get intuitions of how they work because intuitions just because something talks to you doesn't mean that it understands language just like you and the metaphor i always give is if i show you a chessboard and i say like here is one of the most beautiful games in the last year you understand intuitively that you need to understand a lot about the rules of chess to really appreciate it. But you would grant me that if somebody knows a lot about chess, they would find it fascinating and they could go like, oh, this is so beautiful, right? We would not make fun of a grandmaster saying like, this is a beautiful, we believe them when they say like, this is beautiful, right? Even if we don't understand it. Language, everybody understands language, but like how AI uses language is not like us. So what I'm trying to say is we should learn just like you need to learn the rules of chess. You need to learn about how AI is currently using language mm-hmm. because it's not quite like humans. Um, and it's very easy. It doesn't cost anything. And there is multiple ways, whether you want to work with pictures, with video, with text, with whatever domain you want to work in, try to engage with this technology because no matter what happens for better or worse, Mm -hmm. this will be part of our lives for the decades to come. And um, you can have a front row seat in maybe not only consuming, but also deciding where this technology is going if you're an informed agent. So I would close on, um, don't be shy just do something right. with it and uh, you will fig- you will have a really beautiful experience thanks that's a great uh, uh, closing remarks from you uh, lucas and as always great talking with you in a great conversation thank you for your time well thank you for having me and thanks for uh, this invitation i'm very happy to come back back okay bye bye All right, let us now wrap up this season six opener of the Extra AI podcast series, which was a very enriching exploration of the newer technology, the large language models around AI and the real world applications. We were honored to have a renowned expert like Mr. Lucas N.P. Egger joining us and bringing the depth and insight into the conversation. We were able to deep dive into the evolution of the LLMs some of, uh, and also discussing some of the architecture at a very high level. I learned a lot in this conversation since this is some of the new technology and new things going on around. I hope uh, this was enriching and beneficial to you, the audience as well. As you all know, the pivotal part of our discussion has revolved around some of the ethical considerations of deploying AI and large language models We also touch based on some of the privacy concerns and the need for responsible AI usage. So I would like to first extend our deepest thanks to our guest, Mr. Lucas and Piagar for their valuable contributions to this conversation and providing his time and guidance on this uh, topic. The expertise of Lucas brought a wealth of knowledge and deepened our understanding of these rapidly developing technologies. So we are looking ahead this season of extra AI uh, to bring in even more exciting content. We'll continue to explore the most relevant topics in the world of AI as we have been doing. In the next conversation, we'll be bringing an expert and we will be discussing the aspects of image segmentation with deep learning in the context of medical world. As always, you can find more information about these conversations at our uh, extra AI website, xtrawai.com. And you can access many of these podcast conversations, not only these, but there are a whole lot of other podcast conversations as well. If you would like to reach out to our guest in the context of today's conversation, I will be tagging him on the LinkedIn message or the LinkedIn post. You can directly reach out to him 
or you can reach out to me raghubanda and i can put you in touch with him as always you can reach out to me via my social media handles like raghubanda on linkedin or rk banda on twitter or you can directly reach out to me on my website extraai.com x t r a w a i.com and finally we conclude by expressing our gratitude to you our loyal listeners your engagement and curiosity and feedback always makes these conversations possible and even more interviewing so stay tuned for more illuminating discussions and conversations on extra ai and thank you for being part of our journey into this world of ai so wherever you are dialing in from have we are tuning in from have a happy good morning afternoon or evening happy predicting the future with ai technologies thank you and bye bye now